If we, as fans of art and creativity and storytelling, consider an artist's most invaluable asset to be the singularity of their artistic vision, then Oscar-winning filmmaker Guillermo del Toro should universally be thought of as one of the finest artists working in the medium of cinema today. As Avatar, The Way of Water director James Cameron put it in the foreword he wrote for the ultimate del Toro compendium, Guillermo del Toro, Cabinet of Curiosities, my notebooks, collections, and other obsessions, there is no one out there in the film landscape to even compare to him. In fact, describing him as merely a filmmaker is far too limiting. The Mexican auteur's identity as a cinematic storyteller is in truth more akin to a kind, fearless, benevolent, meticulous, web-spinning conjurer of dark magic and raw humanity than it is to a traditional writer-director. I wanted to create this atmosphere so you would get like a, like a sample of what the movie looks like. In the last 30 years since his feature-length independent film debut, Kronos, was released in 1993, Del Toro has been writing, designing, and directing a steady succession of massively crafted, critically adorned works in his preferred genres of horror, fantasy, action, comic book, and noir. In the coming months, both Del Toro's stop-motion animated Pinocchio and his horror anthology series, Cabinet of Curiosities, clearly a concept he is enamored with, will premiere on Netflix. So as a result, now seems as good a time as any to write a brief tribute to the modern master of monsters' stupendous career and his ongoing mission as an artist, filmmaker, and steadfast champion of the power of cinema. With Dick Smith, Rick Baker, or the great Forey Ackerman, it really gave me several things. One of them was hope. One day, when Guillermo del Toro was a young child, his father, who worked as a car salesman in his hometown of Guadalajara, Mexico, actually ended up winning the lottery. This miraculous event transformed his family's previously middle-class financial status quite literally overnight. I never dreamed that I would climb over the moon in ecstasy, but nevertheless, it's there that... One of the purchases that Del Toro's father made with his newfound wealth was a private home library, fully stocked with classic works of literature, both fiction and nonfiction, as well as numerous academic textbooks that covered everything from the history of art, cinema, biology, myths, fairy tales, and virtually every other major subject matter that Del Toro would later become obsessed with infusing into his work. He was reportedly a quiet, introspective kid who found that comics, horror novels, and genre movies spoke more to his inner life more truthfully than anything else. From the lovable, damaged crew of the creatures in Hellboy, to the melancholic, deeply lonely ghosts of Crimson Peak, one can draw a direct connection to any point in the horror master's filmography to a childhood spent feeling profoundly misunderstood by the world that surrounded him and finding empathy and companionship with monsters. He said that he's always identified with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a character more than any other creation in fiction. Del Toro was predominantly raised by his devout Catholic grandmother and attributes this intense period of strict puritanical adolescence to informing his perspective on the concept of monsters as empathetic saint-like figures of redemption in his mind. In interviews over the years, Del Toro has remarked on how he's found legit kinship and sense of understanding of himself and the world through the metaphor of monsters as projections of our own flaws, fertilities, anxieties as human beings. Del Toro's idiocentric perspective and fascination with monsters and other characters who are misunderstood, ostracized by society, was forged in the cubicle of his childhood and echoes throughout his work. Guillermo's films always have an otherworldly quality. His collection of leather-bound notebooks have become objects of fascination for Del Toro fans. The pages of these famous hand-drawn volumes are bursting at the stitches with unbridled imagination and knowledge. The gorgeous felt pen sketching, diagramming, and lyrical note-taking closely resembles the scattered but precise style of Leonardo da Vinci's iconic notebooks. See his creative mind leaping around on page after page of these notebooks. But for Del Toro himself, they function as more totemic objects of tribute to the fantastical imagination of the child he once was. Del Toro's belief in collecting, creating, and surrounding himself with beautiful objects and works of art 
inspire his inner child was manifested in the creation of his personal workplace, a museum-like library of his home he calls Bleak House. Bleak House was designed to be sort of a compression chamber where we can create. Inside, multiple libraries teeming with novels and textbooks, secret passages, and rooms decorated with wall-to-wall -wall artwork and life-size models of horror and fantasy iconography awaits. Entering Bleak House is virtually the same as stepping into a three-dimensional projection of Del Toro's mind. Uh -huh. You know, this is the first movie. Pan's Labyrinth is rightfully one of Del Toro's most beloved and acclaimed masterpieces, but Pan's lesser-seen sister film, which also serves as the first installment in Del Toro's intended Spanish Civil War fantasy dramas, The Devil's Backbone, is his first truly monumental altruist achievement. The 2003 ghost story, set in remote Spanish orphanage for young boys, sees Del Toro coming into his own as a world-class image maker, mastering the design components of makeup, effects, lighting, and production design. It's also where he begins to flesh out his most prevalent thematic motive, the sympathetic monster. In this case, the tragic monster of choice appears in the form of the ghost of a boy named Santi, whose spirit lingers on the same cracked, tragically fragile form in which it has left the plane of existence. The image of a trickle of blood slowly floating out of Santi's cracked porcelain-like forehead is a haunting evocation of Del Toro's overarching animating principle of humanizing monsters in his films. The troll market sequence from Hellboy 2 alone is a stunning aesthetic showcase. In this single set piece, this comic book sequel pulls off an even more baroque feat of creature design and set creation than other artistically minded filmmakers managed to pack into entire films. Even a movie that was ostensibly a for hire directing job for Del Toro, like Blade 2, is still dripping with this unmistakable hyper detailed gothic art style which permeates every corner of the frame. A comprehensive collection of the best images found in Del Toro's movies would fill the towering walls of an endless corridor, but a few images that would most definitely be included in the collection would be the oversized bomb that drops from the raining heavens straight into the orphanage courtyard in the Devil's Backbone, the gorgeous and calamitous plant monster that springs from the New York City sewers and explodes into an emerald wave of vegetation in Hellboy 2 The Golden Army, young Miko in her blue dress running from a titanic kaiju down a crumbling street in Pacific Rim, Ilsa and the amphibian man embracing as water rushes out of the bathroom in the shape of water, and of course, the iconic image of Ophelia standing before the grand bisected trunk of the toad's tree in Pan's Labyrinth, and rest assured, the list could go on and on. In addition to being one of the modern masters of filmmaking, Del Toro also occupies the same rarefied air as the likes of Martin Scorsese in terms of his incredibly adroit and diverse knowledge of cinematic history, paired with his unique facility for insightful yet accessible film scholarship. He is a filmmaker who even after 30 years of working at nearly every level of the film industry, hasn't lost a single ounce of childlike passion and wonder for his transformative quality of the medium for which he operates. That's not even mentioning the numerous other interesting and critically acclaimed projects that Del Toro has produced over the years, and thus the growing list of promising young genre filmmakers like Andres Muscati and Andre Overdraw, for whom he has provided a rare and coveted platform for their stories to be made. With a, with a thunder, and I could relate to that, and I remember sitting listening to the counting. Guillermo del Toro is an exceptional creative force and a giant in the international cinematic community. But perhaps his most admirable quality is how he is somehow both generous with his knowledge of cinematic history and artistic philosophy and spectacularly gifted at synthesizing his wide breadth knowledge into his creation of a war and cinematic style that is all his own.